In a world where many people see reality as a circle or a rectangle, the truth is that issues are cylinders. Rather than a two-dimensional understanding, we will flush out the three-dimension complexities through nuanced conversation and civil, respectable discourse to highlight all perspectives on controversial issues. I'm your host, William Roosh, a high school teacher who's trying to transform education as we know it. Welcome to the Anti-Echo Chamber. This is Cylinder Radio. Hello and welcome to the next episode of Cylinder Radio. I am your host, Will Roosh, high school teacher and now podcast host. And today, our Cylinder topic is going to be a little bit different than some of the things that we've done recently anyway, and it's about strip clubs. So just a disclaimer, it's going to get a little taboo. So if you have children around and you're not sure, why don't you listen to it first? And it's still going to stick with what the theme of this podcast is all about, which is highlighting nuance and trying to understand things deeper through some respectful conversation. And that conversation with me is going to be, the conversation I'm going to have will be with Victoria Rocca. She is a beauty business entrepreneur, but she is a former exotic dancer. So Victoria, thank you for for doing this. I was gonna tell my wife like, oh, this would be an interesting topic. I have to do some research and development, so let's go out to the the (laughs) club. But but she actually uh, connected us. And and I wanna talk about this because I think it's, like so many things I cover on this podcast, a lot of things are more political, but this even gets into, into the politics, is it's just not fully understood from a lot of different levels and angles and things like that. So thank you for doing this. Can you just introduce yourself to the audience and then we can start talking about it? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So my name is Victoria Rocca. I am the owner of Victoria Glam Permanent Cosmetics in Louisiana. And I've been out of the strip club since... 2011. Um, Some of my girlfriends and I who met at the club are still in touch. We're still friends. We kind of did things at the same time, like graduated college, got married, had babies. We call ourselves the class of 2011. But I uh, did my first three years of undergrad working at the strip clubs. So I saw quite a bit. I worked at a few different clubs and I met a lot of different people. And I will tell you, some of us really are in college, but most of us really are not. Mm. Okay. (laughs) So I can confirm that's a joke. That is a big joke. I'm working my way through college. (laughs) So so I'm not sure exactly where to begin because there's a couple of things I want to hit on. But in general, um, what do you feel like is is something that the the average person, the person who might go for a bachelor party or something like that, or the average girl who might just go with her boyfriend or husband like one time on just like a, a whim, what do they, what are they missing? What do they not understand about the world of strip clubs and exotic dancers and things like that, that you only know if you spend a lot of time there, work there, things like that? Um, I think that that's kind of a broad, what would I tell these people? Cause they're, they're all very different people that you mentioned. So somebody on a bachelor party, I would say, I'm not for sale and you're drunk and you're not cute. Um, someone who is there with maybe her husband or her boyfriend that's two different people. Does she want to be there? Are they there together? Or is she there because he's there? So she's there. So to the girl who's there because her boyfriend is there, not because she wants to be there. We don't want your man. We have our own men probably half of them like women. And, um, that's not like, I didn't come to work to find your husband. You know, your husband hangs out in strip clubs. What do I want him for? To the girl who is there with her husband, because they enjoy that. Thank you so much. I appreciate the support. Those girls are the ones who amp you up more than anyone. They sit at the stage, they throw money, they tell you, yeah, oh my God, yes, oh my God. I love those girls. They are my people. Yeah. Um, For sure. So I guess one of the themes that I get from this podcast, and I've had on a whole bunch of, I mean, I've had on everything. I've had on um, Republicans and Democrats. I've had on white people and black people and Middle Eastern people and Muslim people and Jewish people and gay people and trans people and all these different things. One of the things that I, that I get, which is awesome from this is people are different. And, and this is going to apply here, I think too, which is you, if you don't have a lot of interactions with black people, then you think, well, black people think this way. 
And then you start having a lot of interactions, you make friends and stuff and you go, oh, black people are very diverse. Trans people are very diverse. All of these things. That, like, what is a typical, quote unquote, typical stripper? I mean, is there one? So that's a good question. And it's just as complex as the buildup you gave it, right? There's lots of different types of strippers, but I think that you can categorize them just like you, you know, I guess could potentially say women versus men or young people versus old people. You could say there are strippers who are in it because they're broken people, people who come from broken homes or who have drug use or who, you know, maybe were raped or molested as a child. And now that's kind of the world that they live in. I don't, I've never verbalized this, but in my brain, I always kind of think of the dark and the light. So I think of people who live in the dark, like in the shadows, kind of the underbelly, their own subculture, and people who live like you and I in the light. Like we're up during the daytime, people see us for who we are, there's no hidden skeletons in our closet, we're not leading a secret life, we live in the light. There are women, you know, who are very damaged and very hurt who work in the strip club, and those are probably the ones that you can buy. Mm. And then there are women, you know, when you say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you say, just to clarify, when you say you can buy, does that mean like prostitution? That's what I mean. Okay. And then there are women who work there who are there because it's really good money. It's flexible schedule. Um, You know, maybe somebody can watch their kids at night, but not during the day and they're finishing their degree or, uh, you know, in my case, I just got into a bad situation where I owed a lot of money at one time. And then I thought, this is the perfect college schedule. Actually, I'm going to stay here long after I had paid off my debt that kind of thing. There's really two, it's, to me, it boils down to two different types of people and you can see it when you walk in the club. Oh, that makes sense. So, um, I don't want to just, just gloss over that. Like when you say that like there's prostitution at strip clubs, is that, I mean, I don't want to like blow up people's spots and get like business owners, get their place busted, but is that like a, like a norm? That is not a norm everywhere. And some places it is very much the norm. And I know that that's not a great answer, but it's the true answer. So the first club that I ever worked in, I worked um, in a club on Bourbon Street. There's tons of them. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm not going to say which one. But when I went out there with my roommate at the time, who is who got me into dancing, she was also my boyfriend at the time, sister. She said, listen, I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay, that pimp, this is exactly what she said to me. That pimps and hoes shit, that's real. I said, what do you mean? And she said, that pimps and hoes shit is real, Victoria. When you look around the room, you're going to notice that certain girls will always go to a table where a guy is sitting over and over and over again all night long. They're not, that's not like their client that they see every night. That's their pimp. And they're giving him the money that they're making right there in the club. And that was terrifying to me because the view that you and I have as normal people who live in the light of pimps and hoes is like, well, he beats her and he owns her and she has to give him that money. And I think for some people that may be true. I've never personally been, no one has ever opened that up to me. No one has ever walked up to me and said, God, you know, I really don't know how to get away from my pimp. Like you beat the shit out of me last night. I heard someone only once say, and she didn't think she had a pimp. She thought she had a boyfriend, but she had a pimp. She said, um, well, my boyfriend's at my house right now and he has my car. He's coming get me, but I didn't make any money tonight. I don't want to get in the car. Cause when he finds out that I didn't make the rent tonight, like he's going to beat me. And all the girls were saying, you should leave him. You should leave him. And I was just standing there thinking, that's it. That's yeah. the pimp and ho shit she's talking about. Yeah. Like it's really men using women and they like, sometimes the women are so broken. They don't even see that. Like, you know, they'll say, sometimes you don't know you've been abused until way after. Right. Yeah, yeah, similar to that. Wow, that's <clears throat> so. I guess it gets into you know like why this is controversial and taboo is it's it's again multi-dimensional. It's really like layered like an onion because you know prostitution is illegal, but pornography yeah. is legal. So it's like, will you have sex with me for money? Illegal. Will you have sex with me for money? I'll put it on my phone and then put that on you know Pornhub or something like that. Then it's fine. So like I don't so like even like you st- want to know why. Huh? Do you want to know why? Sure. Yes. Taxes. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, can't. So, Who's going to tax yeah. it if you and I sleep together and you give me some money? How right. are they going to get any tax out of that? But if we put it on a platform to sell it, then they can get a sales tax from it. So. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it just seems so silly. There's these, there's these laws that whether, I mean, there's certain drug laws that the more you dive into why drugs are illegal and which drugs are illegal and why it, it just boils down to a very, kind of corrupt government element of it. And, and prostitution seems like the same thing. You but could just, certainly see it that way, yeah. When you, when you operate in that world, though, 
because of whatever, like in that strip club world, like that's able to kind of go down. And is it because people don't want to talk about it? Like people, is it just, you know, I don't know if I'm, if I'm being clear, I guess within the strip club, it's like, well, you just know, well, that's that person's pimp. And that like, that doesn't happen when a girl works at Walmart. Like he doesn't, she doesn't have some customers just over in the corner hitting over paychecks because right, it right. kind of operates in those shadows. So does that mean we shouldn't have the shadows? Does that mean we should clean them up? How do we clean them up? I mean, there's a lot there. You know how people say, you know, if you were to legalize drugs, then w crime would not not exist, but crime would be mm -hmm. cut down significantly because, you know, there's turf wars and then there's uh, money issues and whatever. And I think that it's kind of the same thing. I think mm -hmm. if you just said it was legal and you didn't care, then you would have a lot less girls being kidnapped. You would have a lot less girls being murdered. You'd have a lot less girls disappearing. Like I can actually tell you, these girls I don't think were prostitutes. I think that these were actually their boyfriends. And this was not on Bourbon Street. This was in a small town in Louisiana elsewhere. I saw these two girls, I had seen them a few times. So one is a dancer and one's what they call a shot girl. She, you can buy her for dances too, but she never goes on stage. She walks around with a tray of like really watered down cheap shots and sells them for like 20 bucks. Okay. Um, and they were really good friends. They decided, I will never understand this. They decided to roofie themselves at work. So they sat together and they put GHB in their drinks and they drank them and they thought they were going to have a really fun night. I don't know why you would want to be messed up in any form while you're holding money and people are actively trying to grope you. I'm not about that life. I never understood it. I never drank at work or anything mm -hmm. like that. But so they did. Well, they, I don't know if they gave themselves the wrong dose or if they couldn't handle it or what the issue was, but one of them started seizing. She fell off her bar stool and she started seizing on the ground. And the other one was like, you know, panicking and she didn't know what to say if she should tell the truth or not. And everyone's yelling at her like, what's wrong with your friend? Is she epileptic? Did she take something? What's the problem? So finally she says, you know, we took the GHB or whatever. Well, a few minutes later, she's also on the ground seizing out of control. So they go through their, they don't call the cops because they don't want the cops at the strip club. They go through their phones until they can find someone labeled like boyfriend or brother or whatever. I'm pretty sure it was a boyfriend. He said, I'll be right there and pick them up. They threw these girls in the back of a van and took off and I never saw them again. So who did you even give them off to? Did they ever get medical help? Are they alive? Did they go to rehab? Did they die? I have no idea. Wow. Isn't that crazy? A, that is. So, I mean, and it does they were have a young. lot. Of, they were like 20 years old. It does have a lot of parallels to drugs. Cause I read the Johan Hari book, Chasing the Scream, which kind of advocates for the legalization. And when you look in the countries that have legalized it, Portugal, Switzerland, places like that, I mean, crime does go down, but also part of it is like, the the stigma attached to it is we put a stigma if you're an addict that you're a criminal yeah. and not not that you're sick but you're a criminal and and it's, so if you're in a strip club it's not that you have you know whatever you have mon you're monetary whore. needs or something like that yeah you're you're just you're bad you're no so good you have to pay a, a fee to the parish or for you i guess county that you're in whenever you become a dancer and that fee is, you know, a different price for everywhere. Maybe it's like $50 in Broussard or $60 in um, Baton Rouge. I don't know. But right. so you go in and they treat you like a criminal. They take your mugshot, they take your fingerprints, and you owe them money for your fee. And it's jokingly referred to as, or maybe even lovingly referred to as your whole fees. Okay. And so sign right here, you know, as you're signing your, your contract, you're an independent contractor, you sign a contract with the club. You have to resign it every year. Pay your, uh, you know, sign your contract and you have your license. So you show them not your driver's license. Well, you do show that too, but you also have to show your dancer's license and they say, good. So you already paid your whole fees. Wow. So, um, I think a, a big topic that um, I want to hit on is the, the idea of respect. And I think that we could have this conversation, have the cylinder just be respect and talk about strip clubs because there's two kind of roads I want to go down and get your thoughts on both of them. One would be the respect of women for themselves. And what's really awesome, Victoria, is you own it. You're just like, this oh, hell yeah. yeah. And yeah, you made me who I am. Yeah. But you don't see that as like a negative or a flaw. Like you really flip that on its ear, but other women I'm sure do. Don't want to talk so, about it. A lot of it's they Don't mindset. want anybody to know. They're embarrassed that they ever did that. It's yeah. whispered about. Um, yeah, I just walk in the room and say, oh, I used to be a stripper. I'm like I was. When I walked into the strip club, I was a very broken person, but I was not um, broken by other people. I was just like an insecure teenager who was a little depressed. 
I had, um, I had been, my high school sweetheart killed himself. And then I was dating someone else and he got into a bunch of legal trouble and I had bonded him out. And at 19 years old, he ran bail and I owed $18,000. And so here I am depressed, uh, left twice now, essentially. And I owed all this money. And here's my only friend in the world saying, this is what we're going to do. We're going to fix this. We're going to go and make some quick money really easy. It's the most fun job. You get paid to party. Basically, you just sit around and talk to people and when men are trying to woo you, how do they treat you? Do they tell you like, Hey, you're a whore. Here's some money. No, they say you're so beautiful. Do you work out all the time? That's amazing. How do you do that on the pole? That's incredible. You're going to be skinny your entire life. I swear to God, you don't hit the gym. Like people are so nice to you. And all of those girls who I made friends with at the club that I ultimately stayed at the most are my friends to this day. You know, we're not bonded through trauma. We're bonded through, you know, just being coworkers basically. Um, I grew up there. I learned sales there, which Sheila and I, your wife and I talked about the other day. Basically all sales are the same, especially in the strip club. It's a really yeah. great model to follow. You know, yeah. you don't just sit down and say, Hey, do you want to lap dance? That's not going to get you any money. You sit down and you talk to somebody and you kind of get to know them. And actually that's what most people want. Most people are not there because they want, you know, to be teased. Most people are there because they are missing something. Right. Clients yeah. I mean, customers are there for that yeah. reason. Yeah. 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 Like why people go. So that's, that's, yeah. you know, that's another thing that, um, well, hold on. Then I'm going to go back to the other side of the, of the respect thing, which is, um, and maybe these are related is, you know, why people go to strip clubs is wide ranging and for it sure. could be very comfort. It could be a fun party thing for like a bachelor party. It could also be a guys are very lonely. Girls won't look at them. Girls won't be nice to them. They won't smile at them. So they will there, you know, and, and it's, it's almost like, in some ways, it's like, I'll gladly give my money to feel good. And it's like, I'll gladly make some money to make someone feel good. Like that, that seems like a win-win in a lot of situations. And you know what? A lot of them, older men come at like five or six o'clock. They're not there for dances. They know that dancers are not going to be on stage right now. Um, if you work in a club that has like a steakhouse or something, maybe they have dinner there or maybe they just have a couple drinks and they kind of form a bond with people. It almost feels comfortable to walk in and go sit down and you forget yeah. that you're wearing a bra and booty shorts. You know, you sit down and you talk to Bill for about an hour and a half until your shift starts and you guys have dinner. He probably buys you dinner and he feels like, you know, you're the daughter who doesn't talk to him anymore. Mm. And now he's got that relationship or, you know, his wife passed away three years ago, but he's not having dinner alone tonight. And he likes to talk to somebody who's young and has things to talk about and doesn't just tell you like their joints hurt because the rain's coming. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, it's, there's, it's a really complex, there's a lot of complexity to why people go to these clubs oh, and yeah. people are just living life in these silos and they are very lonely, but there are also guys who I'm sure are I'm horrible idiot. toward women and Terrible. disrespectful and don't view like, the women who work in strip clubs are people, they're human beings. And the way that they treat them is as if they're a thing and they don't have feelings. They don't have parents. They don't have disposable. thoughts and emotions. They're disposable. Disposable. So, the worst yeah. night of my life was the most money I ever made in one night. Um, these six guys were there and they came in with the seventh man. The seventh man was from the town I'm from, but the six guys were from the town I'm working in. They were trying to woo him for business purposes. I guess they were trying to get him to sign a deal or something. And um, I mean, he treated me terribly. I was by security. I was lifted up from my chair and sat on his lap. And they were like, these guys are throwing money. You're going to make a lot of money. Cool. This dude was so wasted. He treated me horribly. He picked me up and body slammed me on the ground. All of his friends threw me a hundred dollar bill, $600 right there. Uh, his friends begged me to take him to VIP. So that's like $300 for half an hour. Okay, cool. So we went up to VIP. Of course, the first thing I said was, no, he's going to kill me. But we went up there and they promised they'd come check or whatever. Before they even took our drink order, he said, are you going to fuck me? And I said, mm -hmm. uh, no. <laughs> Who told you that? And he said, then let's get out of here. Let's go back downstairs. I want to be up here. Okay, cool. So we go back downstairs and his friends asked me, that was really quick. That wasn't even five minutes. What happened? Tell him the story. $200 each right there. By the time he got kicked out, I had made $2,200 and I think he'd been there 90 minutes, right. but he treated me terribly. You know, he, he would throw me around or he slapped me while I was talking once and security kept looking at me for a cue. Like, do you want me to get, kick him out or what? And when he finally, um, he had like 
I was on his lap, but he fell backwards in the chair and then he hit someone next to us and they also fell on top of us. It was like a dog pile. Security was like, that's enough. This is getting to be libelous or not. I don't know. Is that libel? I don't know. They thought it was going to become a, some kind of lawsuit issue. So they were like, get out of here. Um, people really treat you that way sometimes. Like guys do not care. So, so, well, that's not true. That's very general to say. Some of those guys yeah. do not care. So what, what's the mindset when you're in that situation? Because there's probably going to be people, and this goes way beyond strip clubs. This goes to just jobs in general or things in life where you're in this, you're in this, this weird tension between I'm making a ton of money. This money is going to be good for me, good for my family, good for my future. And I'm being disrespected. I'm not enjoying this. And how do you deal with that tension that I'm sure a lot of people deal with? This will transcend just strip clubs. I never truly felt disrespected. I felt like that guy was overserved. And that was before he even walked in the club. I felt like, you know, oh, he's out of control. He's a businessman. He's in a suit. He owns a business. These people are dying for his business. He's not an asshole like this all the time. He's wasted. That's how I felt at, you know, 19 or 20. He probably is an asshole all the time. Um, the most disrespect I ever got actually was from other dancers and they didn't last because the clubs that I worked, well, the club that I worked in most of the time doesn't allow that. If you don't get along with the other girls, you got to go. Hmm. So if there was a girl who had a problem with me, I would just walk up to the manager and say, listen, Robert, we got to talk. I don't want any problems. I'm telling you right now, I'm not instigating it. I don't know what her problem is. And this is the situation. And he would say, well, you know, you've been here. I know how you interact with other people. It's not an issue. And either the girl would chill out or she would be gone. That was the only time I ever felt disrespected. And that was more out of jealousy. Just when you get a whole bunch of girls working together, you always have a little of that. Yeah. The, um, like there is a real difference between male strip clubs and female strip clubs. And Greg Giraldo, one of my favorite comedians of all time, had a, a joke where he basically laid it out. And I'm not going to mimic the joke because he's way better at it than I am. But essentially there are strip clubs that have, women with like really bad scars and they're way overweight and they're just angrily marching up and down the stage. But then you go to a female strip club and it's just like, or a male strip club, I'm sorry. And, and it's, it's like guys who are just six packs and they're ripped and they're just like gyrating and like, like they're all with the rhythm and stuff. Like they're like, they're, it's a lot they're more choreographed. <laughs> it seems like it's like a positive, upbeat, fun experience <laughs> At a, at a male strip club and oh yeah the and they take more clubs. abuse than we do yeah they really take more abuse the women will reach up there and grab them and security doesn't pounce on a lady and say hey no. hands off the package there's a real and and there's but there is like an uh, even there are strip clubs i'm sure like uh, of women dancing who that that feel just like a fun classy kind of thing like the, the traditional like scores in in new york or whatever but yeah. there, but like there is a real difference there and I mean, what do you, what do you see the reason is, and I'm sure we could get into like, you know, the evolutionary biology and stuff, but just as someone who's been in that world and, and, you know, live life a little bit, like understands this on a different level. Like, what do you think that that reason is? Um, well, I'll be honest. This is the first time I really think about it. So this is just mm. off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. I think that there are way less strip clubs geared for women with, you know, male dancers. There are way less of them. Yeah. So there's less opportunity for employment. You got to be the cream of the crop. But for women, you know, there's, I mean, God, my town has maybe three or 400,000 people in it. And we at one point had three strip clubs, you know? Right. So it's kind of just come one, come all. And if you stay, you stay. If you don't, you don't. I actually worked with a girl, um, not at the club that I love and talk about all the time. Another one, the one where the girls roofied themselves. She had chunks missing, large chunks missing all over her body. And no, but she was beautiful in the face. Yeah. But when you looked at her body, which is what, you know, she's showing off here, you were just like, what happened to her? And nobody ever wanted to ask her because it's rude. Oh. So one day I asked her, I was just sitting there chatting with her in the dressing room. And I said, you know, um, what happened? Were you in an accident or something? I can't see how a car accident would take chunks of your body out. But she said, no, I get, I have a baby. I gave birth. And when I did, um, there was some kind of flesh eating bacteria in the room. And it got on her and she started, they had to put her in a medically induced coma. She was uh, under for six months. She never even met her baby. She was under for six months while they just kept carving out pieces of her body, oh trying God. to stop this flesh eating bacteria. And now she's, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to the hospital. Of course she has a lawsuit going, but they just keep that going until you're broke and drop the lawsuit. Yeah. 
So here she was in the strip club trying to make some money while her mom continued watching her baby. Her mom had her baby for the first six months. She never even met her. She was in a coma. Wow. That's, and so that's, sometimes it's, those are the people who need to be there too, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for people to make money and to make money. And you don't know why people are there who, why they're in debt. You told your story. This is her story. I mean, they're, they're there for a reason. And I, th- and I hope that that at the very least, if there are guys listening or young people listening, someday they're going to go to a strip club for a, a bachelor party or something like just remind yourself that these people have stories and we've all been through traumatic things and they have too. So just keep that in mind and be respectful. Um, for sure. Everybody's got a life outside of the strip yeah. club, you know? Yeah. The, um, I think one of the reasons why um, I asked you the question on the spot and then as you were answering, I could kind of formulate my own thoughts too. So, um, but I think it's also like, Men, men are working really hard to always be attractive to women or get to get the girl, you know, like, like it's a man's world. The, the, um, uh, um, who's the, uh, James, James Taylor. No, not James Taylor. James Brown. James Brown. What's wrong? This is a man's like, world. Yeah. yeah. It's like, like it's a man's world, but it wouldn't be any, nothing without a, without a woman or a girl. Like this idea that de- like women are the trophy. Like that's why we do what we do a lot yeah. of times is to get the women. So, you know, women could just essentially walk up to a guy and be like, Hey, you're coming with me for the night. You're going to dance for me. And the guys will be like, okay. Like, but guys yeah. can't, don't have that power. Like, it's so interesting. If a man walked up to me and said, you come with me, you dance tonight. I'd be like, fuck you. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> fuck you, I'm pay not. me. Yeah, but it, it <laughs> works the other way. I mean, and I, I take this to even to like, you know, g- girls that I teach that are, that are young, like to like among like teenagers, like you can level teenage boys. You got to be careful. Don't think you're not powerful. Okay, you are very powerful. And if you tell a teenage boy who asks you out and he's really nervous, like, ew, gross, get away from me. Like, you have no idea how that's going to negatively affect I mean, it crushes him. And I'm not saying girls don't get their heart broken and they don't get crushed too. But I just, I... I think women really have that power and it's, and that's another, the way you see the strip clubs is another example of like, I will just pay just to see you from a distance, take your clothes off, whatever, whatever's under there. I want to see it. It yeah. just shows how much power well, look, women have That girl have had inside. chunks missing out of her body. Yeah. She was there, you know, three or four nights a week and she made a good living. She made plenty of money because it's really not even about your body. It's great if you have a nice body, but they had bigger girls who worked there. They had girls, you know, um, who, you know, she had chunks missing out of her body. I knew a family who worked together, a mom and her two daughters, and they had daughters. Wow. They all three worked at the club and they all made money. It's a, what they call a mouthpiece. It's all about your mouthpiece. It's about how you can, you know, your lip service. Can you talk to somebody? Can you finesse the conversation? And then they want to spend time with you. Are they like you? Are they feel some kind of connection? It's not always physical. A lot of people tell me, well, if I had your body, I would work there too. Well, if, if I looked like you, I would work there too. And I say, you'd probably make more money than me. Are you kidding? Like so many people like you, <laughs> you would make so much money. But it's, so, that's really, it's, that's the power of it, right? Is it's women who know how to talk to a man and kind of convince him. It's a little insidious, I guess. Yeah, it's a little manipulating. Yeah. But guys know what they're getting when they go there. I mean, like, you like, it's, you're, not, you're not doing that at, you know, Whole Foods in the produce aisle, trying to get a guy to go out and buy dinner when you have no interest in him. Like, he's going to a strip club. He should know the deal. You know, as much as guys say, like, I think they, she really likes me. Or that happens at like Hooters restaurants all the time. There's always when you go with a group of guys, one of the guys like, I think the witches really likes me. That happens in strip clubs. Yeah, it does. It does. And it's like, sweetie, no, like I'll drop the mask and I'll be like, sweetie, no, like I have a boyfriend. I'm not here for this. And this is my job. Like you don't have to keep coming back and talking to me. One night was fine. You bought a couple dances. You had fun with your friends. Like I'm not going to go out with you. I don't, I don't want to be ugly to you, but you got to know what it is. Your friends didn't tell you what it is. That's not what this is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think I want to be clear too, because there are probably young people who are going to listen to this, that this isn't to promote being a stripper, or going to strip club, but it's also not at least necessarily to put it down and say, don't go here. This is an informational podcast. This is right. how, what is it really and the good, the bad, all of that. Um, and I think that what we can agree on though, and try and like, like have some sort of aim is let's say Victoria, I, 
Hail you queen of strip club policy in America. Okay. Hi. How do we, congratulations. You're, Thank you. Uh, you're Thank highness. you. Um, how do we make, we want strip clubs to be a place of respect, a place of fun and a place of safety. Number one. So yeah. what changes would you bring about as far as law goes and as far as like, even like, um, informal, just like, um, policies and, 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 um, just norms should we institute in American strip clubs to make them more fun, more full of respect and safer? Can you think of just like things that maybe off the top of your head or? Well, when I think of like a fun, safe environment um, where you can be profitable and so is the club, I immediately think of the club that I spent the most time at, the club in Baton Rouge. It, it was called Gold Club, now it's called Penthouse. Um, I don't know that all penthouses are ran, run the same way, but this one specifically was perfect. I'm telling you, it was a utopia. And the issue there was because of the law. So strip clubs there are illegal. You cannot have them in the city of Baton Rouge, but this strip club was there before the law, so it's grandfathered in. So anything that goes down there that could lose their liquor license, you're out. There's no one drinking underage there. Um, there's nobody doing drugs there. There are not prostitutes there. If, if you can find them, good for you. But I'm telling you, I worked there three years and I didn't find them. So uh, strict, management, strict, the yeah, strict. strictly followed. Okay. Uh, management was wonderful. And that's something that I love about strip clubs. I don't have a manager. The club has one, but I'm an independent contractor. You don't tell me when to show up. You don't ask what days I'm working this week or anything. I, I show up or I don't. And I pay you. They don't pay me. So I'm there. I can make as much money as I want. As long as I pay all of the people I'm responsible to pay in the club, then everything works solidly, you know? So there's nobody saying like, well, you owe me a percentage or um, you didn't make enough tonight. You need to get out there and shake your ass. It's not like that. And I've seen that in some movies. That's not the way that my club worked at all. I was very much my own boss. I was very respected by the people that I worked with. And it was a fun environment because everyone there was happy and getting along. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that clients can feel that too. Well, customers can feel that too. When they're sitting around seeing girls laughing and talk to each other, or they say, Oh God, this is the worst. When they say, Oh, I want her to come in the room and I want her too. And the girls don't get along. You're not going to have fun. That's going to be the worst. So at my club, that wasn't a problem because we're all friends, you know, all 30 of us, 40 of us, whatever actually liked each other. We see each other a few times a week. We make our money and we leave. I think that that club is a model club. I think that that structure works very well. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And I, so, you know, a lot of this, this podcast is about highlighting nuance and, and trying to understand things deeper, but really there's a, there's a goal of with that information, doing something positive, doing something better. So, so I appreciate um, that. Um, I don't think there's anything else that I wanted to, to hit, um, but mm, no, but I guess, um, just if someone is, uh, is in this, in a situation where they are, uh, contemplating going down the, the road of, of becoming a stripper, um, what kind of, what should they be thinking about? Not to say like you should or you shouldn't because we're not here to tell anyone what to do, right. but what should they maybe ask themselves? Because you seem to have gone in and gone out and come out great. You're all good. Yeah. You're a business owner. You're successful. You have a family and all that kind of stuff. Like how can you guide them into seeing, are they the kind of person who can get in and get out? Or are they the person who's going to go take drugs and get taken out of the van? If you have a job. substance abuse problem, stay away from the strip club. Okay. If you can't go to work and not drink, stay away from the strip club. Um, it's like that old movie says, you know, they say, make the money, don't let the money make you. This mm -hmm. club industry is that way. And I don't care what club you work in. You could work in just a regular bar. You are either going to become immersed in the nightlife and that's going to be all that you are, or you're going to make some, you know, use it as a tool while you're building the rest of your life. If you're not responsible enough to, to separate those two things, like this is a job. And then I have regular friends and family and goals and things that I'm working towards, whether it's school or whatever, you know, if you can't separate those two things, you're going to get swallowed up by it. It's going to eat you a lot. I've watched girls do it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like you, you have to, if someone is rude to you or, or, or you don't feel good, like you have to separate that. This is 
just a job. This isn't who I am as a person. This is right. something I'm doing right now at this point in my life. And it's not forever. It's not a career. It's a job. Right. So there has to be an end point and you can't make everything about your life. Like, Oh, these are my friends. Now this is who I hang out with. I spend holidays with them. I spend every night with them. I spend every, you know, that can't be your life because when it's over, you have nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like that takes over your whole life. And you can't let it do that because just like working in a regular bar downtown on the strip or something, that's when that's over, you're the 40 year old who's bartended too long and you have nothing else to show for it. Yeah. But you can turn it like I use the, the story of Jay Z a lot, went from the Marcy project and then sold drugs just so he can have some seed money to start mm -hmm. his music career. And then he went straight and I mean, pretty straight, you know, I think he did stab somebody, but like other than that, like kind of growing and then, you know, he's going to die a billionaire and you know could kind of separate those roles but being a strip a stripper is way less risky than being a drug dealer you know if you do it right and you go with the right mindset you find the right place and things it's like legal that. yeah and it's it's legal so it's legal when, it's cash flow and you can really use that again like you just said as seed money to fund another project or to pay your way through school like you can use it as a springboard yeah and yeah. where i was working that was in baton rouge proper and it was the only one so you could also meet I don't know, maybe a third circuit court judge or some really fancy lawyer who can, you know, oh, you know what? I think you have a case. Yeah. Or uh, one time I met fucking Pauly Shore and that was a mess, but you just <laughs> never know who you're going to run into, you know, Weasel. opportunities everywhere. Yeah. Like, and again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this to try and like lure people into it, but it's, it, that's not what it's about. It's about trying no, to agree. understand things. It's not, not everyone should work in the strip club. It's no, not for everyone. It worked not. out for me. I don't know if I'm an exception to the rule. There's plenty of people it's worked out for, but there's plenty of people who have fallen prey to it. So I don't advocate just to anyone like, you know what you should do? I never say that. No. But um, if someone asks me about it, I say, uh, tread carefully. Right. I'm not, well, I'm not advocating for drug dealing, selling crack either. I don't think Jay-Z is advocating for selling crack yet. That is what <laughs> helped him get successful. So, you know, it's just like, I think more important that we have to look at why was he in a situation where he felt the only way he could was because why do a lot of women feel like the only way they can, you know, if this, like, just to go on like a bit of a tangent, but this woman was in hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical debt. I had um, Dr. Paul Song on, who is an advocate for universal health care. And he would be like, well, she wouldn't have to if she, there was a better health care system. So right. there's a lot of elements and, and angles for this um, that, that hopefully maybe will just spark some thought that this nuance is all over the place. And maybe, you know, even something like exotic strip clubs. Um, actually, what, do we, what should we call the topic for this? Should it be strip clubs with former dancer, Victoria Rocca, or what do you, how should we, or should it be strip club? Should it be stri being a stripper? Like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure really how Legally, to... I was an entertainer. And by the way, girls don't know this. If you work in a strip club and you're listening to me, let me tell you something. Number one, just go ahead and pay your taxes. You don't have to claim everything. I don't care what you claim, pay your taxes. And here's why, because you are quote, an entertainer, your nails, your hair, your makeup, your teeth whitening, your lashes, your tanning, all of that is tax deductible. So there get it go. for free instead of wasting your money. You get financial advice on the, on the strip club episode. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> okay, okay. That's great. No, it's great. You tax never advice. know who you're going to meet in a strip club. Absolutely. So, um, Victoria, I know now you're kind of doing your own thing in the beauty industry and stuff like that. So um, where can people um, see you, uh, talk to you, like and see what you're up to and all that kind of stuff? Just is there anything you want to plug for, for this podcast and the podcast listeners? Oh, for sure. So life for me in the strip club ended in 2011. I, you know, graduated college. I went ahead and started a new career. I got my esthetician license. Um, and I started doing permanent cosmetics, which is actually how you and I linked up your wife. Sheila is my business coach. Um, so I run this beauty business and I actually employ other women. I have an esthetician who works for me. I'm looking to hire another one. I do training, I actually teach permanent cosmetics. Uh, so if you want to, if you're interested in any of that, you can look me up on Instagram, Victoria dot glam, Victoria period glam, G L A M. Um, and probably don't hop on there and be like, what up stripper? Like, um, <laughs> give me like a heart or give me like a double heart or something. And then I'll know you. Oh, you heard me on cylinder. Got yes. It, got it. Yes. All right, cool. Victoria, thank you. It's not, um, it's not always easy to get people to talk about things, um, that are personal like you did. 
and um, and kind of in these these realms that we we often don't talk about. So I really appreciate you coming on here, and um, I hope that people listen to this and learned a little bit and kind of go off with a, with a, some new perspective because that's what this is all about. So thank you. Sure. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Okay. All right. See ya. Bye. This has been Cylinder Radio. The success of this podcast and the educational revolution that I hope you will be a part of is dependent on those who find value in it. Please take a few moments to review us on iTunes so the show is more easily found. If there was a perspective on today's topic that was not highlighted in this episode, or you have an idea for an episode topic that you want to understand more deeply, please email us at cylinderradio at gmail.com. Follow me on Instagram at Will Roosh. W-I-L-L-R-E-U-S-C-H. Thank you for your support and I look forward to the next one.